Welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast, dedicated to the Holy Family. I'm Thomas V. Miras. Today I'm talking to writer Anne McElhenney about her new film, Gosnell, The Trial of America's Biggest Serial Killer. As you're probably aware, this podcast is an outgrowth of the website catholicculture.org, and we are currently in our fall challenge campaign. The campaign features a challenge grant of $60,000 offered by our catholicculture.org boosters. It's going to run until the beginning of Advent, December 2nd. And between now and then, every new donation up to $60,000 will be matched. So if you appreciate the Catholic Culture podcast, now is when whatever you can give will count the most. So to get your gift matched, make a donation at catholicculture.org slash donate. I'm very excited to share today's interview with you with one of the writers and producers of the new film Gosnell, The Trial of America's Biggest Serial Killer. Before we get to that, I'd like to talk a little bit about another film I saw recently, and that is The Happy Prince. By the way, the subject matter of this film is such that if you're listening to this in the car with your kids, you're going to want to skip ahead to the interview at about the 10-minute mark. Although, I guess, uh, if you have small children with you, this episode as a whole really isn't for them. The film is about the final years of Oscar Wilde between his release from prison and his death. Now, I wouldn't exactly call myself a fan of Oscar Wilde, although I certainly love some of the things that he wrote, particularly his fairy stories in the collection that has the same title as this film, The Happy Prince. But I've been fascinated with him uh, as a person for many years, with the many contradictions in his life, and particularly with how some of his art seems to undermine the philosophy he advocated elsewhere. Now, Oscar Wilde is sort of known as a gay icon, a gay martyr, and the film certainly portrays him as that. But many people don't know that he also had a lifelong fascination with Catholicism, uh, and he converted to Catholicism on his deathbed. Um, Some people try to downplay this as a merely aesthetic fascination, but I don't think it was just that. And the reason I was interested in seeing this film is that I had read that it gives an honest portrayal of his deathbed conversion. The film was written, directed, and starred in by Rupert Everett. And while I think I would have to see it again to really make a judgment of the direction and the writing. Uh, The acting was absolutely fantastic. Definitely an amazing performance as Oscar Wilde in his declining years. Everett is portraying a man who has lost everything. He was imprisoned for gross indecency, but essentially for sodomy. He exited prison to a world and a life very different from the one he had known before. He was estranged from his family, the public that had adored him uh, now ignored or even hated him, and he only had a few loyal friends who would come to visit him or stay with him uh, in his exile in various parts of Europe. Now, as expressed in the letter he wrote in prison, De Profundis, Wilde had had, I don't know if I would call it a full conversion, but certainly a movement towards that. He was convinced that he had essentially brought these sufferings on himself with his immoral behavior. And as the film portrays it, when he first gets out of prison, he is very determined to not go back to his old ways and to do whatever he can to make amends to his uh, poor wife and his two sons. But as the film portrays it, and I don't know if this is accurate or not uh, entirely because I'm not that familiar with the period of his life between prison and death, As the film portrays it, his self-destructive tendencies uh, soon get the better of him. And to the film's credit, it really shows those tendencies to be exactly that, self-destructive. But it somehow does that simultaneously with seeing him as something of a martyr and even something of a Christ figure. Wilde in the film even compares himself to Christ, although somewhat lightheartedly. And unfortunately, uh, in interviews, the filmmaker Rupert Everett, who is gay himself, uh, has said that he views Wilde as a sort of gay Christ figure, which is, of course, blasphemous. But it's interesting that he doesn't shy away from the fact that Wilde was essentially bringing these troubles on his own head. Something Wilde admits in the film, among other places, in reading sections of his Ballad of Reading Jail. Once the film gets going, it really focuses quite a bit on Wilde's relationship with two characters who followed him to Europe. 
The first being Bosey, or the young Lord Douglas, whom Wilde had gone to prison for buggering, and who unfortunately Wilde is unable to stay away from uh, once he gets out of prison. The other is Robbie, Wilde's literary executor and former lover, who clearly has Wilde's best interests at heart much more than Bosey does. But Robbie, though he is in large part angry with Bosey for bringing Wilde back to his old self-destructive ways, is clearly jealous of Bosey for his relationship with Wilde as well. It was unfortunate to me the degree to which these characters dominated the film, uh, particularly in one of the last scenes at Wilde's funeral, they have sort of a cat fight which I don't really think a filmmaker who understood the significance of Wilde's conversion on his deathbed would expect us to care much about. The conversion sequence itself is very affecting. The priest who receives him into the Catholic Church is played by Tom Wilkinson, who I recognize as having also played the priest in The Exorcism of Emily Rose, interestingly enough. There's a scene where uh, the priest and Robbie are in a car going to Oscar Wilde's deathbed, and when Robbie informs the priest that he's going to give Oscar Wilde last rites, the priest says, well, isn't he a Protestant? And Robbie breaks down in tears and says, he was meant to be a Catholic. So I really appreciate the way that Everett showed not only Wilde's deathbed conversion, but the fact that he had felt the call of the Roman Catholic Church to his soul for a very long time. Uh, there's another lovely scene earlier in the film where Wilde is sitting in a small church in France, and this very old and clearly very in physically infirm priest sort of drags himself in front of the tabernacle, not knowing anybody else is there, and kneels and adores God, and Wilde is very moved by that. In a way, though, it seems that the film is too preoccupied with Wilde's deteriorated relationship with his public and with the few friends that he has left uh, to realize that this conversion sequence is a happy ending. And this is, might be exacerbated somewhat by the fact that the film has this structure which jumps around all over the place in the timeline. I think I'd have to see the film again to decide whether I think this storytelling technique has any real purpose in the film other than to be confusing, but I probably won't ever see it again, so oh well. There's another narrative device that the film uses, which is the story, The Happy Prince itself, which is given to us in bits and pieces throughout the film. For those who aren't familiar with this story, it is a beautiful tale of self-sacrificial love, and it's really hard to see how the story connects with the film as a whole unless you accept this idea that Wilde was a martyr for love, which the film does seem to want us to think. There is a line even where he says, I need to love and be loved, and it's like, dude, you're deluding yourself. Now, it's worth noting that in the film, the thing that kills Wilde is syphilis, and this is an extra interesting plot point because we don't even know that that's why he died in real life. That's just a theory that some people have. So it's this weird cognitive dissonance that the film has where it simultaneously gives an honest portrayal of the fact that Wilde is seriously self-destructive and makes him to be a martyr for love at the same time. And it kind of reminds me of the way uh, that people who die of AIDS are treated, uh, particularly artists, and they are spoken of as though they were martyrs, but it's like, you know, Society didn't kill these people. It was, <laughs> it's almost like if the cigarette industry were to make ads treating people who died of cancer because they smoked too much as martyrs, <laughs> that would be really funny. But of course, even with all their rationalizations, cigarette addicts would not go so far in narcissism as to make that case. A further difference being that one could be blameless for smoking back in the day and not knowing it's bad effects on your health, but despite not knowing about AIDS, you wouldn't just be an innocent victim of the behavior that caused it. So those are my thoughts on the film The Happy Prince. I suppose I would not recommend it, but I thought it was worth commenting on given that it portrays uh, Wilde's conversion at the end of his life and not only portrays it honestly, but without any sort of criticism of it or attempt to dilute his motives for doing so. After the break, my interview with Anne McElhinney about Gosnell. Thank you. 
Ann McElhenney is an author and documentary filmmaker. With her husband, Phelan McCallier, she has written and produced a number of political documentaries, as well as the New York Times bestselling book, Gosnell, The Untold Story of America's Most Prolific Serial Killer, and now the drama film Gosnell, for which they brought on Andrew Clavin as screenwriter and Nick Searcy as director. The film, which stars Earl Billings, Dean Cain, and Sarah Jane Morris, is currently in theaters. It even broke into the top ten in the box office for a little bit, and is well worth seeing. And McElhinney, welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. So maybe I could start with the fact that I could not see this film in New York City. I had to take the train out to uh, Westchester in order to see it. That's very disappointing. I mean, it was in New York City for a while. And in fact, I mean, it's very disappointing because the film was on in Kipps Bay in Manhattan and was doing really, really well. In fact, was like number, I think, number seven out of 30 screens there. And they dropped it. And the same here in Burbank. I mean, I'm talking to you from Los Angeles and we had a, right. it was on in Burbank. Again, it was doing huge money for the cinema, you know, packed houses continuously and they dropped it. And it's not the only place in America where the film is doing really well and they've dropped it anyway. Why do you think they did that? I mean, was there any sort of pressure coming from outside or what's going on there? You know, it's very hard to know, but I think enough people now know in America that, that Hollywood doesn't necessarily follow the money, that very often they make choices based on ideology. And, you know, there's a bias here. I mean, you know, it, it just so happens and somebody else interviewed me this morning. You know, we've just had those Brett Kavanaugh confirmation hearings. And, you know, all of that vitriol, all of that... What people, the display that people saw was about abortion. It wasn't about anything else. And most right. people know that. People, and it, that really shocked them. So if anyone, you know, it's, now we have this movie, which is very unusual. I think it's doing something that maybe has never been done before in relation to the abortion conversation and debate. And, you know, as a result, we're getting incredible opposition. And this dropping of the, the film from theaters is not the only opposition we've had. You know, we also have theaters not putting up advertising, not putting up posters. We've had people arrive at, at movie houses and be told, are you sure you really want to go and see that movie? We've had people buy tickets and then look at the ticket and the ticket isn't for the film. You know, we have, we have a lot of stories of very active opposition to this film, even in the movie houses. We've had it also, obviously, with NPR. We've had it with Facebook. But it's right. everywhere and it's real and it's real. You know, that this is not a conspiracy theory. And anyone who wants to find out more about that, just look at the stories on Facebook from people who've written to us and on Twitter. It's kind of amazing. Yeah, I've seen a number of those. Yeah, it's it's pretty interesting. You know, I wouldn't have ex expected it to be the case that theater would drop it when it was doing well, though. They, that surprised me even. Yes, and me too. <laughs> Not in a yeah. good way. Yeah. Now, as far as the press's treatment of the film, a number of major media outlets like the New York Times that would review much smaller films on a regular basis completely ignored this. So I think I think it would be fair to say um, that there's something of a blackout. Yes. But on the other hand, though, I have heard from a couple of critics that there weren't, at least in cities like Seattle and Philadelphia, they there were not pre advanced press screenings. Is that the case? That is incredibly disingenuous. There are no, yeah, huge mass of movies have press screenings. The film was sent to everyone with a link. It couldn't have been easier. It was on their laptops for them to watch. This is how it's done nowadays, particularly with small indies. We can't have press screenings in every city in America. We, do, we, don't, we hardly have the budget to advertise the film, never mind do that. This is very, this is incredibly disingenuous. And I, I'll really prove it to you, actually, because the last film we made, which was a documentary about fracking called Frack Nation, was reviewed by the New York Times, was reviewed by the Los Angeles Times, was reviewed by Variety. And it was a small documentary. This film, however, has not been, you know, reviewed by any of these people. And this lie about, you know, that it wasn't, we didn't have press screenings. This is complete nonsense. The film was sent to them, was sent to them and sent to them repeatedly in links to their to the film critics. And they've chosen not to not to review it. And, you know, they're very, very sweet on reviewing pro-abortion films. Oh, sure. There was a film a couple of years ago called Obvious Child. It was a romantic comedy about abortion. I've said that super slowly because to let it sink in, uh, a romantic right. comedy about abortion with Jenny Slate in the lead role. And it was a romantic comedy about abortion. And, you know, they couldn't, the media couldn't have loved that story more. I mean, you, you had the situation where Jenny Slate was, in, was interviewed, you know, night after night on all of the big TV shows. Everyone had her. And, and the movie, I, and I'm comparing myself to that film, because, again, it was a kind of a small budget film. It just made $3 million in the box office. We've obviously, you know, exceeded that already. 
And yet they couldn't have loved her more. And anyone who wants to look it up, Jenny Slate's obvious child, you'll just see how she was treated in comparison to us. And, you know, our movie is one of the most successfully crowdfunded movies in history. That in itself right. is, an, is newsworthy. Yes, exactly. You know, we should have gotten a better a better run for it based on that. Yeah, well, I'm glad we had the opportunity to clear that up because I had read that in the Seattle, I forget what paper in Seattle had said that. And I think a paper in Philly had said there weren't you know, advanced press screenings. But yeah, okay, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Because, you know, some people were saying, well, maybe they're making a bigger thing out of this th- than it really is, because maybe some of it is on their end, they didn't promote it properly. But of course, you know, y- you make a great point about, you know, a lot of this thing, these things are done with links. Yeah, absolutely. Nowadays, I mean, yeah, I've absolutely. definitely heard of heard about that before. But yeah, so maybe we can go back to the beginning of this project, you and your husband, did it start with the book first? Well, it didn't. It, now, when I look back, it did when you think about it now. But, but you know, our original idea was to make a movie. And, you know, we raised money on, kick, on you know, on, on Indiegogo. We started by trying to raise money on Kickstarter, but they wouldn't have us. They wouldn't allow us to describe what the film was about. Uh, they said it would offend our community guidelines. So we had to go to Indiegogo. Right. And we raised $2.3 million from 30,000 people. I mean, it's an incredible achievement. And then we thought, you know, well, we've got the money now. We can make the movie, you know. And we started to do interviews with people. And as we interviewed you know, people from the DA's office, people from the investigation team, the CSI, the cops, the DEA, all the different news organizations. As we interviewed them, we realized, you know, there's a lot of stuff here that'll never be in, that can never be in a movie that would be, it would be very unsuitable. The film would, would end up with a with an R rating. You know, we couldn't possibly do that. So in so what we decided to do was, you know, in the meantime, while we're waiting to get the movie out, to get the to make the movie, to do all of that, that we would write a book with all of this information that would never really appear in the movie. And, uh, and that's what we did. And I suppose we didn't realize that it would take so long for the movie to get out. We thought that the movie and the book come out at the same time, but it didn't turn out that way. It, it, the bo- it, getting the movie out was very, very challenging. But the book came out um, last year and, you know, has, you know, it sold out on every platform. You know, we even got invited to the White House because the, film, because the book was so successful. And I think people have appreciated the book because it's very detailed. And it tells a lot of things that you really would never want to see in, in a movie, but it, and it's a tough read. And the movie, I will say, I mean, it is very, it's certainly upsetting, but it is, it's pretty respectful of, of people's boundaries. I, yes. I guess you could put it that way. No, that's a very good way of putting it. And actually, we were really careful about that. And that was a very early decision, you know, because we could have gone a different direction, which would have made the film an R-rated film, and it also would have been a horror film. And I really mean that in the true sense of the word horror, actually, sure. because it would have yeah. been real... And we thought, you know what, we want this film to get a PG-13 rating, which is what it has. We want this film to be something that young people can go to. We don't want it to be something that turns, that frightens anyone, you know, that would frighten you or that would make it impossible yeah. for you to go and see a film. So, you know, we've had no one complain about being, uh, seeing something that has um, frightened them or anything like that or a horror thing. So, yeah, we were, that was an important decision not to show anything. And people have, so, you know, a few people, very few though, have criticized us for not showing the picture of baby boy A. And we are very clear and very un, you know, unimpressed by that uh, pressure, actually, because it would have been wrong. It would have been very wrong to show, I don't believe any movie ever in history has shown a dead body of, a, of an actual human being in a movie. And that child deserves, has some, some privacy issues that need to be respected. So, yeah. yeah, you know, what we do is, in fact, we show the, the we, in the movie, when we shot the movie, we did show the actual photograph of baby boy A to the jury who played the jury in our in our movie and yeah i was wondering about that yeah. and then we ju- we just did one take it just it was one take because it had such an impact on them that you you can see it in their faces so we see the reaction of people seeing the picture but we don't see the picture ourselves and for people who haven't aren't familiar with the story this is one of the babies that was killed after birth yes by gosnell and he's one of the, you know, and he's very much the reason why Gosnell is in prison for, for life. So it re- did it really come down to that photo? We obviously had to make some changes for the movie from a dramatic point of view. So I think all of the, you know, I've seen all the pictures that were shown eventually through the trial. You know, there were 47 bodies also found in the clinic the night of the raid. And I think the pictures had a massive impact on the, on the jury. I think there's no doubt about that. Because it also was like, yeah, people, because people kind of, you know, don't see... The reality of the pictures are, are, it's very striking. So yes, I think this picture, particularly of baby boy A, who, who everyone remembered very well, who, because there was a conversation about him, because two women in the clinic took photographs of him, because Gosnell joked about him and said, this baby's big enough to walk me to the bus stop. Yeah. Because of all that, people remembered that baby and it had a big impact. 
Now, from what I understand, the film was largely based on things like uh, court transcripts, eyewitness interviews, and things like that. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. You know, we acquired the, we bought the the trial transcripts because you can't, you know, you honestly cannot improve, you know, if that's the right word, but what people said under oath, under pain of perjury during the trial is so, you know, strong. You wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want to rewrite it. You wouldn't want to say anything else. And, And we thought it was very important that we would have that testimony as much as possible verbatim in the movie and we're we're very happy about that yeah and there's just a lot of there's a lot of reality that sort of stranger than fiction things in the film and and uh, i love that you you included in the end credits real photos police photos and things like that of things nothing gory but of things that were shown in the film in a fictionalized version exactly and there were some of them were things that you might think oh they're just doing a sort of little touch to make this guy creepy like the scene where he's playing piano while the police are uh, – Gosnell is playing cl- nice, peaceful, classical music on his piano while the, the police are searching his house. You had an actual clip of that during the end credits that the police really took. And and the same with his turtles. He was keeping these endangered turtles in his office and the, the court, I believe – so that was a real thing too, right? The court yes. ordered – Yeah, the assistant district attorney who was, you know, who was involved in trying to put together this – investigation and then put together, you know, the trial, you know, was asked to take time out of her very busy schedule to take time to work out what to do with these turtles and that these turtles needed to be taken care of. And it was incredibly important that the turtles were taken care of. And, you know, you just think, oh, my God, in, in all of this, how could this even be a thing? But it was. And it was important to us that people realize that the things that are in the movie, the craziest things in the movie are real. And that's why at the end, we have all this documentary evidence to back up all of So the film has many strong acting performances, but I I think, you know, the star performance has to be the guy who played Gosnell himself. And that that actor's name is Dean Billings, correct? Earl Billings. Yeah. Earl Earl Billings. Billings, Yeah. Plays plays Dr. Gosnell. Dean Cain plays Detective Jim Wright. And Earl Billings, people, you know, some of your listeners would know him. He used to be the Aflac guy. Apparently he was in the Irish. I don't even know your strange way. He was in the Affleck ad. So he's quite a famous character actor here in the United States. And, you know, he just did a great job. And I met him at the, you know, again, met him at the premiere. We were were just discussing. I was telling him how much people really appreciate his performance. And he had spent a lot of time, you know, reading about Kermit Gosnell, the doctor, and, you know, talking to me because I've met Kermit Gosnell. I've been in the prison with him. And he's, you know, he took a lot of care and time to make himself represent uh, Gosnell as well as he possibly could. And I think he did a great job. Yeah, it's very nuanced, very subtle, very creepy in a sort of amiable, Yes, you know, I wouldn't hurt a fly kind of way. And that's very much what he's like. That is very much what Kermit Gosnell is like. He has this incredible ability to, you know, he has this very soft voice, mellifluous voice, and he's very plausible, soft-spoken, you know, laughs all the time. And that's very much what Earl Billings brings to the role. And we were very grateful for that. So how did you get the opportunity to speak to Gosnell? And and what was that like? Well, I'm a journalist and my husband and I are both journalists. This is why we, you know, got involved in this story in the first place, because this story had never been properly reported on. And yeah, I mean, we were going to, we decided to write a book about the story and thought, obviously, you know, you need to go in and go and interview the guy who's at the very center of it. So yeah, we went to the prison and spent about three hours with him. But we've also spoken to him like many, many, many times on the phone. And he writes to us. He writes letters, quite a lot of letters at this point. Really? Does he just like the attention or? Yeah, I think he's, you know, he's very narcissistic. And when you meet him, that's kind of comes across very, very strongly that he talks about himself very, in very flattering terms. You know, he talks about himself very often in the third person, talks about how intelligent he is, how he could have been a concert pianist if he hadn't been a doctor. Right. You know, he's, yeah, he's an extraordinary guy. And as you say, I think really does like attention. And I think he's not probably getting that much attention in the prison. I certainly, when we went to see him, he had had no visitors up until then. So, yeah, what was it like visiting him in prison? You know, I mean, very creepy. I mean, you know, I, I had presumed that we, you know, we'd meet him behind plexiglass and that he'd be on the telephone, you know, like you see in the movies. But it, it wasn't right. at all like that. It was much more like a recreation room, like a coffee room with low tables. And in fact, he rearranged his chair and sat, you know, in ridiculous proximity to me, like basically pinned me up against the wall. I had my knees together and he put his chair right in and separated his legs and put his legs on both sides of my legs and then kept touching my leg during the interview. You know, he sang twice to me. 
you know, and then just said very, you know, just very, very, he's very creepy. It was, a, I mean, Hannibal Lecter actually is a very good comparison. He spoke a lot like that and was very disturbing, talked a lot about his own feet. Uh, he has an obsession with feet. And then when you juxtapose that piece of information with the fact that he cut the feet off children and kept them in, in jars, it, it's particularly chilling. Wow. That's quite something. So <laughs> I'm trying to recover from that description. Yeah, that must have given you nightmares, I, I imagine, after... Well, I mean, the whole story gave me nightmares and, and, and made me cry and made me pray. I mean, it's, it's very, very dark. And I think I've said this a few times at, at events I've spoken at where I've said that quite, it's a good thing in your life if evil is theoretical and it's something at a very big distance from you. But when it comes very close to you, you realize it and you recognize it. And it's something different than anything you've read before or anything just when it comes super, super close to you. So I was living this story, particularly closely at the beginning, when I was going through the evidence, going through the discovery, meeting all of the people involved, meeting the witnesses, meeting the people who worked in the clinic, you know, and just going through all of this and then meeting Kermit Gosling himself and reading through the trial transcripts. It's, it's very, very disturbing stuff. It's very chilling stuff that this went on. And, and a lot of the, you know, a lot of the ways I find of, of kind of processing this is it's very much like the Holocaust. And, you know, Fanny Arndt, the very famous writer who, was, who, who witnessed Eichmann being, being tried at the, at the Nuremberg trials, talked about the banality of evil. And it's a very good phrase and very, very good and appropriate to use, particularly in this context, where, you know, I know from all of the things I know now that the people, so Gosnell, you know, was delivering babies alive and then cutting their necks with scissors. And he did this for 30 years with impunity. But he taught everyone who worked for him to do the same thing. They were all doing it. So these workers were doing it. Steve Massoff was doing it. And they all went to prison because of that. But they were having a good time. You know, when I interviewed them, you know, you find that we're, they were joking. There was a lot, of, a lot of laughter, a lot of practical jokes. You know, at the end of the evening, everyone got tips, you know, like in a restaurant. And they got these tips for the number of abortions that were done, particularly the late term abortions. So people were coming out and these are people, except for in the case of Steve Massoff, but in the case of most of the workers, you had people who had a seventh grade education, you know, people who, in the words of Detective Jim Wood, you wouldn't let them mow your lawn, let alone give anyone medicine. And these people were anesthetizing patients. They were doing medical procedures while he wasn't there. And they were just having a really good time. And they loved the money. They all loved the money because, you know, they wouldn't have got a job stacking shelves in Costco, but here they were doing medical procedures and coming out every evening with a ball of cash. And they really liked it. And, and there was something banal about it, but the evil of it is very, very chilling. So there's this exchange in the courtroom in the film, and I'm assuming this was based on transcripts like everything else, uh, where the prosecution brings in this other abortionist to testify about what normal conditions in an abortion clinic are like, what how the law is normally observed and exactly. things like that, whether whether corners are normally cut. And from their perspective, they're bringing her in, I think, in part to show that the case isn't an anti-abortion per se, because they know that they're going to have a real hard time winning on those ground. It's more... What they were doing actually was, and, and we, we changed this slightly for the movie. So what we did was we, we made this into one character. The truth is that there were two abortionists who came into the courtroom to explain what a good legal abortion looks like. Because for the jury, the jury had to make a distinction between what was legal in America and what is murder. And so in order to do that, they really needed to know what was legal. And so they needed these doctors to come in and describe a legal abortion. And when we read that in the trial transcripts, we said, you know, it was actually this. Is, and I'm glad you brought this up. It's the main reason we made this movie was that this testimony would be in a movie and it's, you cannot criticize it because it's not, it's from court transcripts. This is exactly what was said in a court transcript. And, and I think this is the unique part of this movie. I don't believe there's a movie out there in the world has ever been made that has testimony from an abortion doctor describing a good abortion in a movie. I don't believe that's ever happened. And it was very important to us that that was included because it's a record of something that's very, very, that information is not, is not out there. And I think it's really important that we have that. And in, right. the case, in this case, we had Janine Turner play that role. And, you know, one of the interesting things about it is at the very beginning, she's asked, 
by way of, you know, explaining her expertise. Well, you know, you're an abortion doctor. How many abortions have you done in your career? And she says in the movie, Janine Turner says 30,000. The truth is in the actual trial transcripts, the abortion doctor said 40,000. We changed that. We reduced it. And the only reason we did was because, you know, this thing of suspension of disbelief, we thought 40,000 was so many that people would, would turn off watching the movie. They'd say that's not true. Truth is that the abortion doctor had done 40,000. So it's fascinating because, first of all, her motive for coming in is to make it clear to the public that we're not all like him. Yeah. I was thinking earlier today, it's almost as though – I forget if the in the screw tape letters that the apprentice is screw tape or wormwood, but uh, it's as if one of them, you know, went too far and and made a mistake, and the other one has to sort of jump in and throw him under the bus just yes. to, to keep the operation going. Yeah. So it's really fascinating from that perspective. But then, and you can tell me, you know, if how close this is to what actually happened. Gosnell's lawyer, who's defending him turns it around and says, well, you've just described this. Well, he, he doesn't put it this way, but she's just described this gruesome procedure. And Gosnell's lawyer says, Cohen, he says, well, basically what you do doesn't sound so different from what, what Gosnell does. Absolutely. And it's fascinating because he means that as a way of defending him almost on uh, principle. He's not a, he's obviously not appealing to the law there, but he's saying that essentially they're not that different. And he's saying that by way of defense, it almost reminds me of these doctors in England who came out a, a few years ago and said, well, we believe that, you know, babies should be able to be killed immediately after they're born because mm -hmm. there's no difference. Yeah. So yeah. that's just fascinating and kind of mind bending that the defense actually used that in that way. Yeah. And I think it was a really good idea. And, and it's exactly what happened because, you know, the, basically the defense was, you're making a big fuss about this guy killing these three children. And, you know, I don't know what the fuss is about because look at this is what's legal. And I don't see much of a difference is basically what he said. And particularly when the doctor on the stand, which is again taken from the transcripts, described comfort care, because this is the moment where the doctor is asked, well, what if a baby was a born alive? Like while you were doing the abortion, what if a child was born alive? Like, what would you do? What would you do? And this is from the trial transcripts. This is unbelievable. She said, well, we keep it warm. Eventually, it'll, it'll just die, like die from dehydration, die from neglect. And, right. and basically, the defense lawyer says, it seems, it seems to me it'll be, my, it, you know, be a lot nicer if you just cut the neck with scissors. And, I mean, and it, by the way, it makes a lot, you know, and, and that point was made very clearly by that testimony. And, and so anyone watching and for the jury watching, it was like, yeah, that's a really good point. <laughs> you know, that's yeah, a really good point. What's the difference here? That lawyer is played by Nick Searcy, who also directed the film. Uh, yes. How did he get involved? You know, he actually, he pleaded for the role. He wrote us that we knew him. We're here in, in Los Angeles. We happen to know him from here. And he wrote to us a couple of times and said, you know, I would really like to do this. I'd really like to be the director. Um, and he had directed a film before that by maybe 20 years ago, whatever. But he really enjoyed it that time. And he'd like to I think he wanted to do it again. So yeah, that's that's how that all happened. Great. That's how I found out about the film is I, I had just watched this show, Justified, uh, which he plays, a, he has a regular role on or had a regular role on. And I really enjoyed that. And I was looking him up and and I saw that he was involved in this production. This was like three years ago or something. Oh, that, I, I saw that he was yes. involved in the production of this Gosnell film. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting. Then I forgot about it basically until I heard that it was coming out. And it took so so long. How long, how many years was it from the beginning to the end of this process? So Kermit Gosnell went on trial, was sentenced in 2013. So in May of 2013. And yeah, and so my husband was in the court for part of the trial. And so really it started back then. And so now we're in 2018. So yeah, five years later. The film is, thanks be to God, is out, but it has been, it has been challenging getting to this spot. How long is that in comparison to the normal production process of a film like this? You know, funny enough, you know, when you do look about mo movies, you, you know, there are these famous stories of films that take 10 years to, you know, to get made and get re released. So th it does happen, but, you know, it's unusual. And it's unusual for it to have taken so long, particularly seen as we had the money, you know, we, that we started out in a strong position with the, with the crowdfunding, having, having the funds. We made the movie, we, you know, we shot the movie back in 2015. You know, what was, why three years later, you know, is the film only just coming out now? And that's because just everything was very difficult. And we thought that Netflix would just scoop up the movie straight away or that one of the big studios, you know, like that, you know, Sony or Universal and one of these ones would immediately just sweep up the movie because they think, how cool is this? You know, 30,000 people paid for this in little indie 
based on this extraordinary trial that had happened in Philadelphia. But we got surprised. We got very surprised by how we were treated, you know. And so the film is still hanging in there. You know, it's on in theaters. People can go to gosnellmovie.com and find the theater near them where it's showing, you know. And please, people need to really support the film in the box office. It's funny, I get a lot of people writing to me saying, oh, we'd like to show it in the church. Yeah, a church is not a cinema. This is not, you know, a church, you pray in a, a church, you know, you need to go to the movies in a movie house and the box office numbers, that metric is incredibly important in the culture. We need as, as Catholics and as conservatives or as pro-life activists, stop ignoring the culture, work in the culture, because I can tell you the other side are working very hard in the culture to push out very, very pro-abortion uh, material. I think there's three movies, big, big movies being made pro-abortion movies being made. And we know that on the TV, abortion is very much, you know, treated very nicely and treated, you know, like it was in Scandal. You know, as I said, you know, it was in, it was in the romantic comedy, Obvious Child. It's, they're, they're getting their message out in the culture. They're not, they're not waiting to put it anywhere fringy. So it needs to be in the box office and people need to go and watch the movie in the box office. Right. It's funny because they're trying to destigmatize it. And yet the way that they do that is by ignoring any of the actual physical details of of how it works. I mean, if, the, if you were really destigmatizing something, you would want to show it right in, in everything that it is. But but all you're doing is sort of putting a gloss over it. Absolutely. And I made that point in Ireland. You know, they had the referendum in Ireland. And I said, you know, somebody asked me during the summer what I thought. And I said, well, I think one thing that I thought was it was a shame that people voted on something that they didn't know what they were voting for. And, you know, in the whole argument and in the whole debate in Ireland about abortion, they never described an abortion. Nobody described an abortion. And if they had, I think if people had known what they were voting for, they might think very differently. That's the gift of this movie. For the first time, as I said, you have a the good abortion doctor, the legal abortion doctor, describing what a good abortion looks like. And it's an education that people will not easily forget. And it's important that people hear that and watch that. And we have had people writing to us on Twitter, on Facebook, people who went as pro-choice into watching this movie and changed their mind about abortion single-handedly from watching this movie. There's a story out there right now of a young woman who did that. And a lot of people have interviewed her. Uh, Patrick Coralesh, another guy who's a, a big, you know, media entrepreneur here in LA, went, saw the movie, sat through it and came out and said, that's it. I've single-handedly changed my mind from watching this movie. That's the power of the movie, and that's why people have to support it. That's great. Yeah, and I'll say for people who are listening, it, it's a good movie. You know, I'm not the type of person who says you got to support this movie because it's Christian or because it's conservative just because it's that, you know, if it's a mediocre movie, and there are plenty of those out there. But this is a really solid film, and it, it deserves to be seen, and it's, it's all the more important because of the issue and, and because of how it deals with that issue. Yeah. Well, thank you. No, I appreciate that. I really do. Yeah, I have to congratulate you. I mean, I'm sure it was a quite a process getting this done, but you've done something quite remarkable and important that, you know, nobody else had the, I don't know, the, the gusto or whatever word you want to use to, to just like get that thing done. Most people probably wouldn't have thought it was possible. Well, I think most people wouldn't have, you know, wouldn't just wouldn't be able to stick it for as long as we've stuck it. I mean, it's been it, ha it has been tough and it's been really long and we're not done yet. And it's in the box office still, and we want it to hang in there as long as possible. The Catholic Church, you know, should be the, every preaching to get people to go and see this from the pulpit. Um, and we've had some exceptional priests who've done that. It hasn't been general, though. And it'll be, it's a shame because it's a, it's a very unique cultural moment, this. And we don't have many of them. We certainly don't have many of them as Catholics. There are not many moments like this. And it'd be nice if the weight of the Catholic Church could be, you know, brought to bear and get people... Get the word out. You know, we have a, we had a small budget to advertise this movie and, you know, people should, you know, people should, should be helping out because it's, it, it's so important. And, and, and anyone who wants to know the impact of the film, as I said, just go to Facebook, the Gosnell movie Facebook page, go to the Twitter, you know, handle Gosnell movie and look at what people are saying and look at the impact this film is having. It's really, really remarkable. It's been just extraordinary, actually. And people watch the film and they watch right through to the end of the credits in complete silence. We know of a number of theaters where people have watched it. And then someone has stood up and said, does anyone want to stay and pray? And people have stayed and prayed. People have huddled and prayed after they've come out of the movie theater. There has been amazing, amazing reactions like that, which I think I'm not sure the last film where that happened was. I'm not sure it's never happened to a movie I went to that other than this one, but it's, but I'm getting those reports from all over the place. People are driving as well. They're driving like 120 miles one way to go and see the movie because it's not near them 
And right. they, oh, yeah. it's just amazing. It, it's wonderful. And yeah, so any support you can get, any of your listeners, please go and see the movie and see it yeah. now. Don't wait any longer. Go and see it now. Right. And if people want to find out what theaters closest to them are playing the film, they can go to gosnellmovie.com, you said? Yeah, go to gosnellmovie.com and click on theaters and you'll see the list of theaters there. If there's no theater really, really close to you, there's two things you can do. One is you can buy tickets anyway. Buy tickets for a theater that you're not even able to go to. That's one thing you can do. Or you can go to the local theater and get everyone in your church to go to the local theater and demand that they show it. Demand that they show it in your local theater. You can do that as well. Great. Well, Anne, thank you so much for having you on. It was great to talk about this film. I was really excited to hear from one of the people who made it. No, this is great. Thank you very much for having me. For today's reading, I'll just give you a quick quote from Marshall McLuhan. The error of our age has been to regard its diabolical figures and politics as the fruit of impersonal causes and to disregard the historic continuity of devil worship with its perennial appeal to the ambitious intellects of every age. All right, keep your eyes open, pray the rosary, and I'll see you next week. <laughs>